My third grade teacher's name was Mrs. Buck, and she was a really nice teacher. I was a brand new school for me, and I think God knew that putting me with Mrs. Buck would be a good fit to help me with some of those things. And I always listened carefully to what Mrs. Buck said. You know, I can't say honestly that I always listened and did a good job, but I did my best. And one time I overheard her talking with another teacher, and the two of them, they were talking about something I'd never heard of before as a third grader. Why would I? But she said the two of them were going to get together and do something during their prep period. Of course, I had no idea what that meant, and I went right back to doing everything that I typically did in third grade, probably playing soccer or reading a book or doing my math problems. I don't know what we were doing, but I didn't know a thing about it. And now, though, that I am married to a teacher and I'm a parent of a teacher, I understand what... Um, the, did you know that teachers actually have to prepare for their lessons? You know, as a student, I never really thought, like, how does my teacher know what to say? I just went to class and, and I was just probably self-focused and just listening to what the teacher was saying, but not realizing that it takes a lot of work to fill up an entire school day with activities and teachings and different things for us to do and keeping all of us students behaving ourselves. That takes a lot of work. And, and what the teachers often have is what we call a prep period, a prep period. And that's the title of my sermon today is prep period because that's right where we are right now. As we're looking to move forward, as we're looking to see what's next for us as a church or us as a community, us as a state, um, all, across, all across our area, businesses, schools, churches, individuals, families, we're all trying to prepare quickly for what's next and we don't always know what's next but I'd like us to think about our time right now as a prep period now we have all different ideas about how to prepare for what's next right uh, earlier this week when the Supreme Court um, limited the governor's power to unilaterally extend the safer at home order um, the Tavern League of Wisconsin quickly informed all of their constituents to go ahead and open up. And you may have seen some on the news where several bars opened and people went out and were getting together and doing a lot of different things. And um, some of us may feel like that's the right response. Now that the Safer at Home orders have been rescinded, we think, hey, let's get back to life as normal as soon as possible and let's go forward and do this. Others of us, on the other hand, think, you know, maybe a month from now, I'll start the planning process of how I'm going to get back to whatever this new normal may be. Maybe things will never go back to the way that they were, and maybe we shouldn't go back to the way that we were. And as we look around, we might see people kind of running ahead of maybe what we think would be a good idea in some of the decisions that they're making. And some, some of us, are in between there somewhere. And you know, I'll tell you what I think. I've not really commented on a lot of all of these things all along the way, specifically for great reasons, but I'm gonna share with you right now what I think, and it might not be what you expect. I think that every single one of us has a unique reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic and the safer at home orders. There, now you know where I stand. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to tease you, but it's really been my experience all along this process with all the people that I've come in contact with and spoken to over the phone and via emails and people that I've seen. And as I'm driving along, the people that I see and the things that they do, every single one of us has a unique reaction to everything that's going on. And you know what? There is no one size fits all response to all of this even when we did have that people were still debating some of those things even without that people are still debating a lot of these things what do we do now how do we move forward what is the question i mean what is the answer to that question 
I want to offer you some ideas, some biblical ideas, because we've been going through this series called Life in the Spirit. And one thing that we all need to understand about a life in the Spirit is that life, right, it all happens unexpectedly. Things can happen that we didn't realize, we didn't think about, we didn't plan. Were all of us prepared on Friday when the local counties and cities decided to lift the stay-at-home orders after the state was uh, lifted all of their state safer at home? I don't know. But the good news about living our life by the Spirit is that in any given moment, we have someone speaking to us and helping us move forward. And a lot of what we've been talking about in this Life of the Spirit series, and I wanted to let you in on a little uh, preacher secret, has been really to prepare us for what God has in store for our church. And we'll talk about some of those things in a little bit. But what I'd like you to do is turn to Acts chapter 1. And if you have our church app on your phone or the Bible app on your phone, you can open the Bible app, go to the events, search FVCF, you'll find us there. Open up our church app and click on the sermon notes and you'll see everything there. If you have your, your, your paper Bible, you can open that to Acts chapter 1. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 1, the first several verses. But I want us to go into this thinking about how can we be prepared? How should we be preparing, not only for what's going on right now in our community, but also how can we prepare for what God has for us in the future? So let's go ahead and jump in today. And it's in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, first of all. It says this, In my first book I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. So there's a whole lot to unpack here real quick. First of all, who is this person writing to? It says, in my first book, I told you. Well, who is this person? And this person, his name is Luke. You may recognize his name as one of the first four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke was actually a friend with the Apostle Paul. And as you read through the book of Acts, you can see he wrote this entire book. He wrote the entire book of Luke as well as two kind of volumes to one book, Luke and Acts. And right here, Luke says, hey, in my first book, I talked all about what Jesus began to do and to teach. So the book of Luke is all about Jesus. And now he's saying something new here. All these different things that Jesus did in the meantime. And now you can also see that through all this, there's things that happen after Jesus' resurrection, before he was taken up into heaven. It says, he gave his disciples, the apostles, further instructions through the Holy Spirit. So one thing we need to know about the life in the Spirit is that Jesus lived a life in the Spirit. Jesus lived and moved and worked and was empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus didn't do everything just simply on his own, but he worked in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. We also see that Jesus appeared physically to the, his followers from diff, many different times over the course of these many days. And he proved to them in many different ways, not just one way, in many different ways, that he was actually alive. This is really important because a lot of times we think, oh, the Bible is just a story that somebody wrote. But really, the Bible is a firsthand account of people's interactions with God. And when it comes to the book of Luke and the book of Acts, we have someone who actually recorded real life incidents and real life testimony of what people actually, how they interacted with Jesus himself. So we can have faith that the word of God is true because all of these things are documented. And all of these things are put together and all these things have been investigated and there have been multiple witnesses. This isn't just one person saying all this happened. It isn't just one author writing a story, but there were a lot of key personal witnesses to how God moved and worked. Well, that's just the beginning of the book of Acts. Let's keep going in and see what else God has for us today. In Acts 1 verse number 4 and 5, it says this, once when Jesus was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. 
Verse 5, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus said a command. He didn't say, guys, I think it'd be a good idea if you did this, or, you know, why don't you consider doing this? It might be good for you. I don't know. The Bible says that Jesus commanded his followers to stay in Jerusalem until they received a gift. God had a gift for them. Jesus was getting ready to depart and go into heaven. And we studied this in our series so far, a lot about who the Holy Spirit is, what he does, his different titles, about how he wants to connect with you and be your friend. We looked at what Jesus actually said about the Holy Spirit and how Jesus wanted him at work in our lives. And Jesus actually left to go to heaven so that the Holy Spirit could come and be at work and we could live our life by the Holy Spirit. And as we go right here, Jesus says, hey, God's got a gift for you, not only the person of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to get into a little bit more of that, but Jesus used an illustration to help the apostles, the followers of Jesus, the people he was talking to, to understand what was in store for them. And this is how Jesus described it. He said, guys, Remember when John was baptizing people? That was Jesus' cousin John. Some people call him John the Baptist because he baptized people. John the Baptizer is another title he goes by. He said, remember that baptism experience that we had? And remember those baptisms because Jesus began to baptize people and his followers began to baptize people? You understand baptism. And if you've been in church long enough, maybe even in a Catholic background or Lutheran background or some others, you've been there when an infant's been baptized. Maybe you've been around a different kind of church where people wait until they're old enough to make their own decision to live for God or not. And we baptize them at that point. But whatever the case may be, Jesus is saying, remember, Remember that baptism? That was in water. But Jesus is saying, I want to baptize you in my Holy Spirit. So let's think about this for a second. In their context, this is what Jesus is thinking about. And what came to the followers' minds was this. When they all decided to change direction and course of their life, to give their life completely to God and live his way, to quit doing things that are wrong and start living the life that God asked them to live. They would do that openly and they would proclaim that in the community by being baptized. And what they would do is they would go down to the river and they would start to walk in the river and they could feel a different temperature of the water than when they were standing on the shore. And as they got deeper into the water, they could begin to feel the current of the water flowing, hitting against their body, not taking them downstream, but just they just felt the power and the movement of the water against their skin. And they had to get to a point deep enough where they could actually go all the way under the water so that they could get totally immersed in the water. This is how they did baptism. And if you think about it, if, if you've ever been in a river and you've gone totally under the water in the river, it's a different experience than wading into the water. It's a different experience than being on shore. It's a different experience than being at home. And so when they were baptized, they went totally under the water and they were in a totally different environment. They felt the, the, the current of the water flowing against their body that whole time. They were totally drenched in water. And when they would come up out of the water, they were still soaked with water. And Jesus is saying, you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You've made a change of life to follow after me, Jesus is saying. And just like when we went down to the river, you all are going to walk into all of the Holy Spirit and what he has for you. As you step into the Holy Spirit, you're going to get a little bit of taste, you know, maybe if you're only ankle deep. As you go a little bit deeper into the things of God and through the Holy Spirit, you're going to feel the, the, the current of the water coming against you, and you're going to get a little bit more wet. But Jesus said, there comes a point where you're going to get totally immersed in the Holy Spirit, and your life is going to be significantly different. You're going to be totally surrounded in a different environment of the Holy Spirit. You're going to feel the movement of the Holy Spirit, the current of the Holy Spirit. And when you come up out of that baptism experience, you are going to be soaked and drenched in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is saying, that's what's coming your way. That's the gift that God has in store for you. Let's move on. In verse number six, we find this. 
So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore your kingdom? In verse 7, Jesus replies, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. Now, when it comes to rescinding safer at home orders we all have a lot of questions you have questions for me you have questions for the church you have questions about your job you have questions about going shopping getting your hair cut all these different things we have all of these different questions and guess what we don't have answers and sometimes when we come into the things of God, we have all of these questions and say, Jesus, but I know you're talking about this Holy Spirit baptism, but I got this question about, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is Israel become, going to become that superpower on the earth again? And in the middle of this thing, Jesus is saying, I've got a gift for you. And here's how you can receive that gift. Here's how you can prepare yourself to receive the gift that God has for you. This amazing baptism, not just in water, but actually in God's spirit. And they start talking about these socio-political issues. And you and I, when we're talking about safer at home and everything changing, we begin to get all these socioeconomic relationship medical questions begin to come up. And we're trying to grasp at answers. And we want to have all these concrete answers. We want the pandemic to be over. And is it really over? Is it not really over? What is actually still going on? How do I deal with this? What decisions do I make? And there's a lot of questions that come into our mind. And it's the same thing that happens when sometimes we talk about being baptized in the Holy Spirit or some of the things that the Bible talks about because there's all this churchy language and there's all these different ideas and we've all heard different stories and different things or maybe we haven't. And we come up with these questions and the disciples were in that same boat. Jesus was describing something that had never happened in their lives before, something that had never really happened on the earth before in this way before. It had happened in different ways in the past. But in that moment, Jesus says something very important. As people are asking these questions, his followers, his friends, he's asking these questions. He says, guys, it's time to put those questions away and start to focus on what God wants you to focus on. I'm not saying don't be thinking thoughtfully and trying to make wise decisions about safer at home. But what I am saying is that in spiritual terms, when God is asking you to take a step forward, you are going to naturally have a lot of questions. And you know what? Sometimes we're not going to get the answers that we want before we take a step forward. That's why it's called taking a step of faith. I'm going to do an action before I have all of my answers. And we've talked about believing for more this year. We've talked about living our life in the Spirit. We've looked at all of these things about Jesus to help us believe for more. We've looked at all of these things about who the Holy Spirit is, and there comes a point where we begin to lay our questions aside and begin to focus on what God wants us to focus on. And you know what? If you are a believer in Jesus, if you've decided to put your faith in Him, if you've made a commitment to live your life God's way, when questions come up and Jesus says, enough of the questions, start the actions, we're okay with that because he's our Lord. He's our God. And you know what? Sometimes we don't always have the answers. I kind of liken it this way. Here's another way to look at it. If you've ever been around kids, you know they ask a lot of questions, right? Why do I have to clean my room? Why do I have to eat my vegetables? Why do I have to go to bed now? Why can't I stay up later? And sometimes kids can get repetitive over and over again, or it seems to me like kids have an endless supply of questions. If you had kids, if you've had grandkids, if you've ever babysat kids, if you've ever been around kids, if you are a kid, we all have these questions, adults, kids alike. But at some point, mom and dad say, you know what, enough of the discussion, go clean your room. Enough of the discussion, it's time to eat your vegetables. Enough of the discussion, it's time to go to bed. You know, and, and our parents sp have spent a lot of time, and you probably remember yourself and those points of life when you were younger and you had all these questions and sometimes you didn't get your answers that you wanted or in the time frame you wanted or you wanted to talk more about it. Sometimes it becomes even more an upheaval when we're teenagers and, and it comes to curfews or chores or who we spend time with or how we spend our time. And sometimes it can get contentious. But 
there comes a point where the authority of the house says enough, where the parent says enough, not because they don't care about you, they don't care about your questions, they don't think that your ideas are important, but there comes a point where mom and dad know better. And whether you believe that or not, or maybe that's not been your experience with your parents, but there comes a point when you are working for a boss or a company and you keep asking some questions over and over again, finally your supervisor, your boss will say, enough, get the job done. End of discussion. And, and sometimes that can be hard for us to take, whether it's a parent, whether it's at our job, maybe it's a coach on a team, maybe there's, um, you're in a play or maybe you're in a choir or maybe you know, there's a ministry team you're part of or maybe you're volunteering somewhere. Somebody's got to say, this is what's going to happen and this is how it's going to go. And if you've got respect and relationship and trust built with the person who says that, it's okay when they say, enough questions, just do what I ask you to do. That can be hard for us. It's been hard for us to live under some of the restrictions we've been living in. And not all of us have made the best choices about following the guidelines as maybe we could have. But when God asks us to do something, he says it's time to stop asking questions and just step into what I have for you. It's okay that we do that. Now, if you aren't in a relationship with Jesus and you haven't committed your life to him, I can understand why you would be questioning right now. Why would I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? It doesn't make any sense. And it might not. But I tell you what. The only thing that is required for you to be filled with God's Spirit is for you to have a commitment to Jesus Christ. You've made Him your Lord, you asked for His forgiveness, and you've started to live your life for Him and not for yourself or the way that somebody else has asked you to do. Let's keep looking into our story. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We're back into God's plan. We're back. Jesus has refocused us away from our questions and into God's plan and what he has for us. And he says this. He says, now that we've done this, you need to understand what's going to happen next. When you are baptized, what happens is you're going to receive power, you're going to be a witness, and you're going to tell people about me everywhere. And he said that the Holy Spirit is actually going to come upon you. Now, the word come upon you, or that phrase come upon you, um, there's several different words in there, but there's a couple of words that mean the same thing. The come and the upon both come from this idea of, that I've, I've researched before. It's called superimpose. The Holy Spirit will superimpose you. Now, what does superimpose mean? Well, if you've ever seen uh, somebody who photoshopped a photo, somebody who edited a photo, you know what superimpose means. Someone takes a picture, adds another picture to it. Um, in fact, you used to have in the old days, you'd have to take, uh, uh, you'd have to take a picture, take it to the store, get the film developed, get a picture back from the store, take your scissors, cut out the part of the picture you wanted, and and put it on another picture, and that's how you could do it. Now, with the electronics, you can take a picture with your phone, and you can edit it any way you want. And a lot of different ways to do that. In fact, I've got a friend who is a youth pastor, and uh, several of his, uh, uh, w one particular student of his likes to take pictures of his youth pastor's face and put them into historical context. And if you're in the Bible app, you can see some uh, pictures of those. But uh, one of the pictures in there is that their youth pastor appears as one of the stormtroopers in the movie Star Wars. So you can do lots of different things, but that's what superimpose means, because superimposing is this. It's taking something and adding something to it. It's making a photo more than what it is. If you've ever done a Photoshop or an editing, you know, someone can come along and they can have their hand out, and all of a sudden there's an elephant standing in their hand. And as you look at that picture, you know elephants aren't that small. Nobody can hold an elephant in their hand. Something happened there. Someone doctored that photo. But basically what it is, someone superimposed the picture of an elephant onto a picture of someone with their hand out. 
Someone superimposed a picture, a famous picture from a movie or historical reference or a great work of art or some other photo somebody took and put my youth pastor's face right into that photo. The photo is still the same that it always was. There's just more onto that photo right now. There's just been an addition made. And basically what Jesus is saying right here, when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit superimposes himself onto you. You are still you, but now there's more. Here's the thing about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't come in and turn you into a robot. The Holy Spirit doesn't come in and all of a sudden you're a marionette, a puppet on strings. The Holy Spirit doesn't come in and make you a totally different person. He will work with you, but you still have freedom of choice. You still can do what the Holy Spirit asks you to do, or you don't have to do what he asks you to do. One of the biggest things that a lot of people outside of the church have against Christians is that why don't Christians behave better? If they're really living for God, especially if they're really baptized in the Holy Spirit, why aren't they acting in a more holy manner? Why don't they do things differently? Well, we all have free will. And as much as the Holy Spirit's more in our lives and he's active in our lives and he actually comes and lives inside of us, he doesn't take control of us. He works with us so that we can learn to control and change ourselves. But before we get too far down there, let's continue to look at what we have more in, our, in this little episode from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verse number 12. After this discussion, it says this, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance about uh, half of a mile. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here are the names of those who were present. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. Verse 14. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. So, Jesus told his followers, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the gift of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So what did the disciples do to prepare for what was next that God had for them in their lives? And how can we prepare for what's next for what God has in our lives? It says that they went back. They went back to the actual room where they were staying. They were all staying in one place. A lot of them were from different areas of the country. They weren't necessarily staying in the same room, but they had a meeting place where they got together. Now, I don't know exactly how our meetings are going to look. I don't know exactly when our meetings are going to happen. But even if we're not in the same room, we can still come together in that kind of meeting. We've been doing that all along through screens. But what the disciples did to prepare for what Jesus had next, Jesus said, go to Jerusalem. They went to Jerusalem. And they came together in that place. It says they went up into the room where they were. And I think a lot of that, to me, speaks about unity. They decided to have a particular focus. They all had individual questions. They all had individual responses when Jesus was trying to explain supernatural and spiritual things to them. They laid all of those things aside and began to come together. And a lot of things that you and I need to do, whether it's preparing for what God has next for us individually, spiritually, preparing for what God has next for us as a church to do, but even when it comes to this time of rescinded safer at home orders, can we lay ourselves and our agendas aside and say, Lord, how would you have us respond in this situation? I'm in a group of pastors, and one of the things that we've talked about, some of the principles in making decisions as we move forward. Number one, we want to honor God while we're taking steps forward. So we don't want to do things and just, you know, when, when restrictions are thrown off, sometimes we get a little wild, and we maybe do some things that we shouldn't. But even as a church, as we're moving forward in a group of churches that we're connected with here in the valley and across our state and across the nation, we want to do take godly steps. And just because you have an idea about how we need to move forward, that may not be the way we move forward. Some people will probably say we're moving too fast. Some people probably say we're moving too slow. But what we want to do and our intention all along the way is to take steps forward that God has for us. The other thing that we need to be aware of 
is we need to be a good steward and serve our community. That's another principle we want to use as we move forward. A lot of the decisions we've made along the way has to do with we are willingly and voluntarily giving up our times of meetings together so that we can serve our community and help keep people safe, help to slow down the spread of this virus. Just some of those things that what we can do is if we can kind of take our own ideas, political, medical, whatever, and can we move forward in a God-honoring and a loving to our community way? The second thing that they did to show what was going on and how they began to prepare for what God has next was not only were they in the same room, we got to look at the makeup of the people in this room. We read earlier in verse number 13 a list of particular names. Well, those names listed are 11 of Jesus' 12 disciples. Judas Iscariot is no longer with them, the one that betrayed Jesus, but the other 11 were still there. And if you've studied the followers of Jesus, you can see they came from all different kinds of backgrounds. They had all kinds of different issues in their personal lives. They dealt with each other, maybe not always in the best way. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like a church. We come from different backgrounds. We have different things in our lives. Sometimes we don't always get along the best way, but they came together despite their differences. We also had uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Some other women were there and also Jesus' brothers. If you remember some of the stories, sometimes Mary and Jesus weren't always getting along. Sometimes Jesus' family and the disciples weren't always getting along. Sometimes some of the women that were following Jesus didn't get along with some of the guys who were following Jesus. Sometimes some of the guys who were following Jesus didn't get along with some of the women who were, getting, or who were following Jesus. There, were, there was conflict even in and amongst all of that. And even though they were physically in one location, they also had to figure out a way to come together despite all of their differences. And I think one way that they can prepare is not only getting in the same mind, is, is getting in the same mindset, getting in the same place, getting in the place of physical unity, getting in the place of relational unity, and maybe spiritual focus help them to go forward in what God had next. Because if you're familiar with the book of Acts, things begin to really happen after a couple of these episodes that we're looking at here. Now, how did they be, how were they able to come together even though they had all these differences, even though everything so strange was going on? And remember, it wasn't that long ago that Jesus was actually um, crucified. So it's, a, it's an extremely strange time. It's been about 40 days, you know what I mean? There's a lot of different things going on in the life of Jesus that we can really relate to and kind of connect with, with some of the things. They're not exactly the same, but there's a lot of stuff going on. But how did all this happen? And we looked at what it says in there. It says, they were united in prayer. United in prayer. Now, I know whenever you're around a pastor or in a church experience, whenever there's a question or what should we do or what shouldn't we do, there's three basic answers. Number one, Jesus is the answer. So when you ever have a question and somebody's asking you a question about spirituality or Christianity, where you just say Jesus, right? We do that all the time. Another thing we say is pray, right? We always need to pray. Praying is an answer for what ails you, for what's going on. The third answer that is common around church is read the Bible, so Jesus, pray, Bible, those are our basic answers to a lot of things, and there's nothing new there. There's a reason that those are the basic answers for the things that go on around church or in individual people's lives. Because if we get more into Jesus, we get more into prayer, we get more into the Word, that's where things really begin to change. And it may not seem that deep, but living it out is really deep. Some of the people that I've talked to throughout this time who've taken specific steps to move forward in God have dedicated more time in prayer, have dated, dedicated more time in reading their Bible, have dedicated more time in growing in their relationship with Jesus. And Jesus said, don't leave until you've been baptized in the Spirit. So the disciples, the family, the friends, and the followers of Jesus were together in the same place, and they prayed that Jesus would baptize them in the Spirit. So, 
How do we prepare as a church for rescinded safer at home orders? How do we prepare as a church for what God has next for us to do in completing the mission that we have in store for us? What do we do to prepare individually to get in, to make decisions moving forward for our health and safety and, and all the things that have to happen, but also for us spiritually? We need to prepare for what's next in a spiritual manner. How are we making decisions now? How have we been making decisions and looking at some of those things? We need to prepare spiritually for what's next. We need to prepare spiritually for the spiritual activity God wants to do in our lives, getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, sharing Jesus with other people, becoming unified. But we also need to prepare spiritually for our physical interactions with other people. One of the things that I found, and I'm not going to be critical of anybody, so don't take it that way, but my intention is this. I can see a decided difference in some of the reactions that we have when we come from a spiritual standpoint, when we come from a frustrated, exasperated standpoint, when we come from a physically tired standpoint, when we come from I'm tired of being safer at home standpoint, as when we come to these decisions that we need to make if we're prepared spiritually. I'm not criticizing you or anybody else because I haven't made all the best decisions probably myself during this time. And I found that it's usually when I'm not prayed up, when I'm not spent the time with the Lord like I should, when I haven't been prayerful about this decision or that decision. But we need to prepare spiritually for what's next. We can easily make our plans about when we go to the store. And sometimes we put a lot of time and effort. We prepare ourselves in a lot of different ways just to go outside. Do we prepare ourselves spiritually before we go to the store? Do we prepare ourselves spiritually when we go to work? Are we preparing ourselves spiritually as we're looking at how things begin to open up and how we respond to those things? We need to prepare spiritually for what God has for what's next. And we need to... That's just safer at home. But how much more so we need to prepare spiritually because God has been active this whole time and God is still unraveling his plan for your life and unraveling his plan for our church and unraveling his plan for people that we come in contact in a supernatural and a spiritual and a godly way. There are still things we cannot move forward with the rescinded safer at home orders and get together as a church just simply so we can see each other again and just so we can get over that claustrophobic feeling or that loneliness feeling feeling, even though those are maybe part of it. But if that's the only reason we get together, we're getting together for the wrong reason. We need to get together to honor God and to show God what, what, how we can live and obey and how we can sh sh walk in a life that is a good representation of the kingdom to people around us, caring about other people in our church, outside of our church, being a good witness to our community and some of these decisions that we make. But more importantly than even that is the supernatural and the eternal and and we have to prepare spiritually for what God has in store for us to come. I said kind of towards the beginning of our time and our discussion that I would share some ideas of how we can prepare as safer at home is lifted individually and as a church, but also for us spiritually. And it's simply this. What if our prep period was focused on prayer for unity and prayer for becoming a better witness. What if as the Safer at Home orders have listed and we're planning what's next for our church, what's next for us individually, what's next for our job, what's next for our business, what if through that entire process, we also prepared spiritually alongside those things and say, Lord, how can I be a unifying factor in the church? How can I help unify people at my job? How can I help unify people um, at my home? And it's not about coming alongside and saying, I'm right and you're wrong. It's not about somebody else coming along and saying, you're wrong and I'm right. It's about unifying factors and unifying people need to be people bathed in prayer, spend a lot of time with Jesus because Jesus is full of grace and love and mercy and power and strength. And if we carry Jesus and we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and baptize us and we act in the Spirit, we can have a great impact on those around us in a phenomenal way. But if we're not prepared spiritually, if we're not taking time through this opening processes to 
be prayerful and be praying of how we can be unifying, not dissenting, not disagreeable, not breaking things apart. There's a reason I get together with pastors from other Assembly of God churches. There's a reason I get together with pastors from non-Assembly of God churches. There's a reason we get together because we want to be unified in spirit first and foremost, but also as we're making decisions, we want to support one another. We want to have those difficult conversations. We want to wrestle through the problems and the questions and the decisions that we've got to make. And how do we help pastor everyone through this? We, we have to, all of us, take advantage of this time and pray prayerfully consider how we can be loving to somebody who really has a different response to this than we do. We have to be willing to understand that in our church, there's people who have all different kinds of opinions on how we need to move forward as a church, but we need to be a unifying factor to say, you know what? I'm going to listen. I'm going to love. I may not agree. I may not participate in the same way that they do, but I'm not going to be critical of them any more than I want them to be critical of me, and we're going to move forward in God. And say, how can I be that unifying factor? And that only comes through prayer. Unity is a supernatural work of God. I really believe that. But it's not just unity that we need to be praying for. It's about how can our church and how can we as individuals become better witnesses? How can our church be a good witness to our community during this time? How can we show that we care about people in our community during this time? And I don't want you to think it's only about Safer at Home. I'm just using that all the way through because it's what's happening recently. Because what really we need to pray for and what we really need to get involved with, even beyond all the Safer at Home stuff and the reopening, at ho- uh, reopening stuff, is how can we be spiritually unifying with o- other people in our church, with other churches that we're friends with, with other Christians that we know? How can we be a unifying force with people in our community who aren't living for the God and living for the Lord? And how can we be a better witness? And we need to be praying, God, you, we've been talking about living life in the Spirit, and it sounds like here that the whole point of getting the power of the Holy Spirit in my life is so that I can tell people everywhere about you. How can we begin to pray right now and prepare ourselves for what the Holy Spirit wants to do in and through us, how Jesus wants to work through the Holy Spirit in our lives? And how can we get ready to be... I, Take advantage of all of these opportunities that are going to open up to share Jesus with people. How can we move forward in what God has for us? Because there's going to be a thousand new conversations and we're going to come in contact with a bunch of new people and there's going to be a bunch of new things that we're going to put up on our social media. There's going to be a bunch of people when we get back to work, when we see the store. How are we going to encounter our neighbors in a different way? And instead of just me thinking, how can I trick them into t- to believing in Jesus, which we don't do? How can I get a good answer for all the questions that they have, which I don't know that we always need to worry about, even though it's good to be educated. But how about this? How about we pray right now and prepare that as things begin to open up and as our church begins to open up, not only can we reach people through social media and while we're at Safer at Home, but how can we reach people for the kingdom of God as things are opening up, as people are divided, as people have questions, as people are very bold or very nervous or whatever the case may be. When we start encountering people again in a physical presence or in a different kind of conversation, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to say? Holy Spirit, what What do you want me to do? How can I tell stories about Jesus in each and every one of these situations? And not only now, but going forward. We need to prepare spiritually for what's next. And we prepare by praying for unity and praying that we would become better witnesses for the kingdom of God. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus leaves the earth. And for over 2,000 years, he hasn't returned. Just before that, they, the Jesus followers experienced the miracle of the resurrection. But just before that, they experienced the crucifixion of Jesus. They're living under Roman rule. So a lot of their rights, they, they don't have a lot of rights. They don't have a lot of ability to make decisions. Some other government is in charge of them. And if you look at the context of where the people are and you look at the context of where we are, Jesus said, guys, you need to focus. You need to unify as a church because Jesus said, all men will know you're my disciples when you love each other. If we can act in a loving way toward each other and if we can pray focus for unity as we're taking steps to move forward and not just get on this track of, I can go and do this, I can do that, I can go see this person, I go see that person. But all along the way, we're praying, God, help me be a unifying force. Help me to be 
be somebody who's going to unify with the other people in the church, but also be thinking Jesus says, hey, as things are changing in your world, whether there's restrictions or the restrictions are rescinded, how can you be my witness? Because that's what our mission is, church. This is what we're called to do. This is why Jesus called us out. He wants us to be in relationship with him, but there's other people he wants us to bring to him. He wants us to continue to reach out. He wants us to continue to build his church. He wants us to continue to tell people about Jesus everywhere about him. So as we're preparing as a church to move forward, we're going to be praying for unity and we're going to be praying on how we can be a good witness. And as you are pray, as you are preparing to move forward, whether it's spiritually or physically or whatever, I would challenge you to do this. Pray that you could be a unifying force and pray that you could be a good witness, a good storyteller about Jesus and take every advantage to share the good news about Jesus with everybody everywhere. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you're doing. Lord, I know we live in unprecedented times, especially in our generations. Lord, we've got so many questions. Lord, there's so much division. But Lord, I pray that our church could be a unifying force for our community. I pray that within our church, you would help us to unite together, to serve one another in love, to make allowances for other people's faults, to allow other people to work and think in their own pace, in their own way. But help us to come together. God, I pray that Fox Valley Christian Fellowship would be a church that cares more about your mission and more about each other than coming against one another or trying to divide one another. And Lord, I pray that as we love each other in a real way, Jesus, like you said, that people would see you in our lives and that people would know that we're true followers of Jesus because of the way we act towards one another. But Lord, I pray for greater opportunity to share Jesus. I pray for great God conversations all across these next few days and these next few weeks. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church to prepare for what you have next for us by praying for unity, by praying to be a better witness. And God, I pray that you would bless us with that gift of being baptized in your spirit and receiving all that you have for us. So God, as we move forward in you, I pray you help us to prepare the right way not just with decisions, but using the wisdom that you have. And not just physically, but Lord, spiritually. Help us to move forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.